let me now introduce the person who has been so central to our video project of recorded liturgies in the last year and a bit. A formidable team with very limited resources doing formidable work. Um, Ed Lajuk is a videographer and a member of our pastoral, count, pastoral council. And um, he's about to introduce Sister Jean to us. Ed, over to you. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thanks to everybody. And, and it's been um, fun working on the videos this last year. Uh, uh, and uh, as Father uh, Daryl can appreciate, Editing them after the fact eliminates a lot of little errors, flubs, gaps, <laughs> whatever they happen to be. But it's it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, to introduce Sister Jean tonight. Um, for those who don't know, um, you know the the first uh, slide there says 1958. Well, that was the first year that I went to grade one in St. Francis Xavier School in Renfrew, 210 Lock Hill Street. And the building is still standing, although it's not an active school anymore. And um, it was my first day at class and who did I meet but Sister Jean, although at that time she was called Sister Christina. And uh, it, it, was, it was quite a year. Um, I was thoroughly impressed with her <laughs> being a little six-year-old guy in that. And, and uh, I loved uh, being in her classes. Um, I was born and raised in Renfrew as well too, as, as well as Sister Jean and that. Um, and um, her family actually ran um, one of the funeral homes in Renfrew for a number of years, and I think they still do run it. Um, so it's, it's, and came back to Ottawa, you know, traveled around the country, lived in various cities, came back to Ottawa, back in 2004, or 2005, excuse me, and uh, started going to St. Basil's and that. And shortly after that, I ran into Sister Jean and that. And uh, uh, she was the one that actually prompted me to join one of the committees, um, the Mission and Social Justice. And then I ended up going on the parish council. And here I am actively involved. And uh, she's been a uh, a wonderful influence for me. Um, I'm grateful and blessed to have met her back in 1958. And I'm looking forward to hear what she has to say to us about what's happened over the, the last 60 plus years at St. Basil's. Over to you, Sister Jean. Thank you. Anyway, oh. thank you so much, Father, for your kind words. Your sure. kind words. And to Ed, oh, I wish I had my grade one pictures of you. <laughs> but I lost that book with all of those photos. Um, it was great teaching you in grade one. And I loved your mother. She was a sweetheart. <laughs> anyway, it's a delight to um, be able to. Everybody OK? Yep. Yes. OK. Um, to chat with you tonight. And it will be sort of informal. It'd be storytelling in a way. Uh, giving a little bit of our early history, where we come from, uh, the 60 years that we've been somehow affiliated uh, directly or indirectly with St. Basil's, and then uh, what is on the horizon for the community. And so we go back. Whoop, whoop, whoop. No, I can't. What's happening now? I can't, I'm not not getting she doesn't know what's happening i just want to change the slide there we go there we go uh we begin in france uh in le mans which is southwest of, of paris our founder uh was uh, basil moro who was eventually beatified and some of us were privileged enough to go to paris to le mans for his beatification um, he founded a community of priests and brothers, and that in itself is a long history, and wanted a congregation of priests, brothers, and sisters. But Rome would not approve such a congregation, uh, you may well imagine. And so 
The priests and brothers formed one congregation of Holy Cross uh, with the priests with devotion to the Sacred Heart, the brothers with devotion to St. Joseph, and the sisters uh, formed their own congregation, and the original sisters were called the Marianite Sisters of Holy Cross. Mm -hmm. And with special devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, whom I like to refer to as Our Lady of Compassion. Um, the sisters, after migrating to Canada and the United States, eventually formed three independent congregations with General Aids in Montreal, which is our General Aid, uh, St. Mary's, Indiana, and that's right across from Notre Dame, and the original in Le Mans, which eventually transferred to New Orleans um, in Louisiana. So we have one congregation of men and three congregations of women, but all form what's called the family of Holy Cross. And in Le Mans, there is a, a church, Our Lady of Holy Cross, and on the windows at the left, you see Father Moreau and then Mother um, Mary of Seven Dollars. Um, she was the first uh, woman in Holy Cross. Her name was Leo Cadi Dokwe, and um, eventually became known as Mother Mary of Seven Dollars. And we refer to her as the foundress. And in the photo on the right, you see um, the three sisters in the front uh, represent the three different congregations of women of Holy Cross. And you notice our traditional habit, uh, which was our mode of dress for many decades. And um, you might wonder about the name. We hear a lot saying Sisters of the Holy Cross. Why is our name Sisters of Holy Cross? Well, because we were founded in the section of Lamont called Saint Croix. And so it was the congregation, the Congregation de Saint Croix of Holy Cross. Um, our first mother house, uh, the Solitude, is the birthplace of Holy Cross in Le Mans. And so the sisters in France and Louisiana, they kept the name the Marianites of Holy Cross. The sisters in Indiana, when they separated, they took the name Sisters of the Holy oh, Cross. Okay, and then the sisters in Canada, our community, we were known as Sisters of Holy Cross and the Seven Dollars, which we eventually shortened to Sisters of Holy Cross. Mm -hmm. So that is why we are of Holy Cross with you. Um, and Moro often used the image of a tree to describe the Holy Cross family and referring it to a, a mighty tree that spreads its branches uh, throughout the world. And this tree um, is on the grounds of the solitude in Le Mans, France. It's a beautiful, a beautiful old tree. And it symbolizes how the tree of Holy Cross has branched out to all corners of the world. The priests, brothers, and the three branches of women are located in both North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So it's amazing when you think of the dream that one man had and how it has um, encircled mm -hmm. um, As indicated, our patroness is Our Lady of Seven Dollars, Seven Sorrows. And uh, here's yours truly in our habit, that same as very similar to the one that Mother Foundress was wearing in that original picture. And our feast day is on the, the September 15th. And in our original habit, we had this silver heart with seven swords piercing um, the heart of Mary, indicating the sorrows experience as the mother of Jesus. Our habit changed over the years, and you'll see in a minute how that changed, but the seven swords morphed into one, and that is our symbol. If uh, some of you may have the pictures at the side, if you just pull it to the front, you might see the, the full slide better. I, I'm trying to do that there, I've got, okay. Mm -hmm. And so we, our name, our habit changed over the years and so did our name. In, in 1966, uh, we went from the religious name, I was Sister Mary Christina, as Ed mentioned, to our family names. 
Uh, one reason for that was we became we came to realize that uh, our baptismal name was very important name, you know, that's mm -hmm. the name that we were called at mm -hmm. baptism and confirmation. But also um, on a practical level, a lot of communities had Sister Mary Christina's and um, universities and colleges and um, government, they were having problems with so many people with the same, same name. So we went back. So a variety of reasons um, for going back to the name. The change in habit, uh, this is 1964, we moved the, we moved the big cape, the big cap, <laughs> uh, and just had, and the collar. And you can see the heart a little bit better there. Mm -hmm. um, the next one, uh, we removed the band. And this is what we, I would have looked like in 1958 when I started, not 58, in 1966, 66, when I went to St. Basil School. And our names had changed. These are the three sisters that went west in 1968. And then we eventually uh, went to a more modern uh, look, keeping the veil. This is when we went west and the people were very upset that we were going to change our habit. They wanted their nuns to look like nuns. And <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we accommodated. <laughs> and and uh, they, it's so I think, I think they accepted us quite all right. Um, so back to our purpose, we, Moro was very committed to education, particularly in the aftermath of the French Revolution. Uh, education in all its forms was needed for, for children and adults, especially education in the faith. That was a prime concern for the class. This uh, building is, was the original school in Le Mans. It's now, um, I forget what it is, <laughs> uh, but it is not used as a school anymore. And because of this commitment to education, the congregation was invited to send sisters, brothers, priests to Canada and the United States. And um, when we came to Canada, um, Morrow sent priests, brothers and sisters at the, as a at the request of the Archbishop of Montreal in 1841. And they settled in Saleron, Ville Saleron. The priests established the parish, the brothers a school for the boys and the sisters a school for girls. There's a street in Saleron that's called the Saint Croix. There's a street in Saleron that's called Basil Moro. Mm. And our general aid and infirmary are still located in Ville Saleron. And what was our college, our college Basil Moro is now Vanier College. And the priests and brothers serve the people of God at St. Joseph's Oratory, uh, the fruit of their dedicated ministry, uh, the fruit of the dedicated ministry of St. Brother Andre, our first Holy Cross saint, mm. uh, the miracle worker of Montreal. And as I mentioned earlier, Moro was badly beatified, and we hope that the canonization will come soon. The priests in the States are moving to beatify Father Peyton. Peyton. The sister, the, there's a brother in Bangladesh who is a very saintly man and they, some are moving for his beatification. So far, we haven't put any sister up for beatification. I'm it didn't sure. work. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody say it didn't work. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm jumping over a lot of history, as you know. And so we, we were invited to come to Ottawa, the Ottawa Separate School Board, to take over the direction of St. Joseph's School for Girls. Um, so we purchased a home on 240 Daly Avenue. That had been the home of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, who were the former teachers in the school. They were leaving the city. And so their house was for sale. So uh, they moved out and we moved in. And that house on 240 Daily served as a residence for the sisters teaching at St. Joseph's Primary, the intermediate school, the private school that we have there, the teachers who taught music, and the sister students who went to Ottawa's Teachers College in those days, that's what it was called, 
the University of Ottawa and St. Patrick's College. Um, I had the privilege of going to 240 Daily a few years ago with someone who said, oh, you have to come and see it now. It's um, Buddhist monastery. Mm. And the last time I lived at 240 Daily, we were in the full habit. And when I went to visit 240 Daily, uh, I was greeted by a Buddhist nun in a very simple dress, and complete um, hair, <laughs> and bare feet. It was the very simplicity of it was it was really quite interesting, and beautiful. And but that house was eventually sold, and we had built a, a new building on 1026 Baseline Road. We had another residence on Laurier Avenue, which was our novitiate, but I'm not going to go into that. And so the 1026 Baseline Road residence became the location where the sisters teaching at St. Basil's Parish uh, lived, those teaching in the elementary and high school. And so we traveled every day by, um, oh dear, dear. Uh, Mr. Mess, Mr. Mess. We were, oh, what do you think? There's a name that escaped. There, there, there's it's, a long card where you've got seats facing the back. And so, who's? Pardon me? I thought I had the word in there. Um, we're, we're coming over to the, the next slide, which is of the, the residents. Um, And here is our residence on Baseline Road. Mm -hmm. This was, we moved there in 1957. I was a novice. Uh, novices lived at this end of the, the left end, the left side of the building. And the professed sisters were at the far right. In those days, the professed sisters were separated from the novices and postulants. And we had each had our own dining room. We were together in the chapel for prayer. Um, and it's from here that we traveled to the school, um, St. Basil School and St. Joseph's High School. And here is St. Basil School. It opened in 1958. And it was the blessed on the Feast of St. Basil, June 14th, 1959. When I taught here, my first year I taught down in the classroom in the bottom right hand corner. The primary grades were on the first floor and the upper grades six to eight were upstairs. The second year I was there, I was in a portable classroom that was out in the parking lot to the left hand side. And that was quite fun teaching grade three in a portable classroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the first principal was Margaret Cameron, and she was followed then by Sister Eunice. Um, Sister Eunice, originally from Renfrew, and she stayed until her retirement in 1971. Eunice lived a long life. Here she is celebrating her 100th birthday with her sister Clara Thacker, her brother Ray Leto, who came from Renfrew for the came to Montreal for the occasion. And in behind it is Pat Murphy and myself. Pat Murphy and I were both teachers uh, when Eunice was the principal. And Pat had the older girls. And if you notice the school, there was no gym, there was no auditorium. But the summer of the fall, the spring of 19. 67, she, her team won first class honors in a gymnastic competition because they practiced during the recess up in the hall, the upstairs hall. Uh, that, was, that was quite a feat in those days. Uh, what was important was teaching the faith, but also trying to teach the, a well-rounded um, program. Mm -hmm. Um, other teachers at the school were Sister Gerald James, Nora Phelan, students called her Jolly James, and Sister Patsy Brennan. Some of you will remember her. Mm -hmm. 
for both. Um, and they were followed by Sister Mary John, Gwen Doolin, uh, Sister Mary Gladys, Kathleen Martin, and Sister Mary Christina, myself. Um, others were Joan Quinn, and we'll see her picture later on because she was also at the high school. Uh, Pat Murphy, who did gymnastics. And we had marvelous lay teachers. And this is just the few that we could remember. Um, Mrs. Casserly, Catherine's mother, she taught kindergarten and she was a wonderfully dear woman, as was Mrs. Thomas, the grade four teacher. Miss Spratt, who I think just died a few years ago. Um, I think she taught grade six or seven. Uh, Ken Kurz uh, was a real favorite of Sister Eunice, mm -hmm. as was Carmel Horn of our parish, and both Ken and Carmel were at Sister Eunice's funeral. And we all loved the French teacher who would come in and gave us a few minutes breathing room while she taught French to our children by McAllister, as she was known then, and by Halstead. Yeah, she totally taught with her. When I left the school and was going out west, she had a farewell party. It was my first, the first time anyone had a farewell party for me. Other years, you just moved from this place, that place, that place. But the staff knew I was moving and she had a lovely farewell at her home. And I still remember the gift they gave me was a record, a recording of James Last and his band. I mean, that's the 60s, that's 68. Um, when I would get lonely out west, I put the band, I put the record on. Well, that didn't happen too often, but. And then we worked so closely with the Bazillions in the parish. And this is just a, a partial list. Father Sylvester was the pastor while we were there. Father Kel Kelly, Father Dietrich, he eventually left the priesthood. But while he was there, he would come to my class. The kids just loved him because he'd come with his guitar. And often we would have um, masses in the classroom. And that was a delight. That was wonderful for the children. Uh, Father Ruth, everybody, whom everybody loved. I was thinking today I could have added a, a more recent, um, oh, no, the name is gone. Anyway, the, that's what happened with the old age. You think of something and then it's <laughs> we can all identify. <laughs> I told the sisters the other day and they don't believe me, but I said to go back and read it. In the uh, scriptures for this past week, there was the, the gospel of the wine. Don't put new wine in old wineskins. And I always remember about the wineskins, but the, toward the last line, it says, but drink the old wine. Old is good. And so, <laughs> you, know, a little bit of, you know, for tonight from the scriptures. And then we moved to St. Joseph's High School. In 1958, Father Flapp, who was the Spirit General of the Brazilians, and he later became Cardinal Flapp at Winnipeg, he asked the Sisters of Holy Cross for Sisters for St. Joseph's High School. The school was to be co-institutional, the first in the city and the first Catholic high school in the world. The sisters would teach the girls and the Brazilians would teach the boys. Um, September, but in September, the school was not ready. Uh, so for the first semester, the, ta the staff taught the four grade learning classes in St. Basil's Elementary School. Um, and I understand that they were in the, the, the lower classes and the St. Basil's School was upstairs. And uh, the first sisters there were Sister Genevieve, the Sacred Heart, Genevieve Moore, and Sister Agnes Louise, Selena Wadsworth, as principal of the girls section. The Bazillions were Father H.B. Reagan as principal with Father Ed McMahon. But, whoop, whoop, whoop. Don't know what happened there. Yeah, you finished. The there we go. Um, but that first semester on December 3rd, Father Reagan died suddenly while teaching. This was a tragic event that devastated the staff and students and was quite traumatic for some. Father Reagan was replaced by his, fa his brother, uh, Father Basil Reagan, until 1962, when Father Richard Sheehan replaced him. He was my teacher. So, 
began as co-institutional, eventually became co-educational. This partnership of the Sisters of Holy Cross with the Brazilian community was always respected and appreciated. Um, the new year, 1959, uh, the new high school opened. Um, both schools, both the elementary and the high school. <laughs> The property of the Jewish community. Mm. Of the Jewish community of Ottawa. Um, the first sisters, I mentioned them, but we'll say a little bit more about them. Sister Agnes Louise, Selena Wadsworth, the principal of the girls. And then she was the vice principal when the school became co-ed and earned the affectionate nickname Aggie Lou. Agnes, Agnes was known for her teaching of English, having earned a doctorate in English at the University of Ottawa, and eventually graciously and generously donated 16 years to St. Joseph's High School. In his homily at her funeral, Father Richard commented that she was a woman of great faith. She was a gifted and talented teacher, and without exaggeration, one of the best teachers ever. Because she was excellent. But to her class, interest, wisdom, and love. She could take the weakest student in English under her wing and bring him, her, to a level that enabled them to pass the old honors matriculation exams. No teacher in the country had a record close to hers for grade 13 departmental examinations. That was quite a commendation by Father, Father Shane. Um, who himself was a, a very fine teacher and principal. And then Sister Genevieve Moore. Sister Genevieve may well be remembered for preparing students for debating competitions. And she should have, to bet she's not around to help our, our leaders, eh? And there were debate last Wednesday, last week. She was the coach of a team that was highlighted in the, the journal. Um, as described as an unusual debate, because both debating teams, the affirmative and the negative from St. Joseph's, won the final at the University of Ottawa debate, over 21 high school teams from the Ottawa Valley. That was a pretty marvelous feat from St. Joseph's High School. And Jenny may also be remembered for her passion for social justice, especially the great boycott in California in the 60s. I don't think uh, we ate grapes for months at Baseline. <laughs> Her commitment to this cause and the nonviolent means promoted by Cesar Chavez was edifying to her students as well as her younger sisters. And Sister Jenny also surprised everyone by walking in the 40 mile walk sponsored by Oxfam. Not once, but twice doing the whole thing. I did the first one with her, but I was out west for the second one and I probably would not have done a second one. Other sisters who taught at St. Joe's and afterwards, <laughs> some, of you, some of you may have stories to tell. Yes. We have lived with all of these sisters. So uh, you people have stories from the school. Uh, Sister Regina, the Sacred Heart is among the fave. Sister Doreen uh, Withers, Sister Catherine of Bologna, Marian Powers. All of these sisters now have gone to God. Uh, Sister James Zena, her, she was Corinne Cyril. Um, she died very suddenly on June 3rd, 1963. She had a very short illness. She was in the Civic Hospital. So that was uh, another uh, sad time for the high school. And many of the students in her classes came to the funeral at St. Augustine's Church. Um, but not all the sisters at St. Joe's were teachers. Some of you might recognize this young lady. Some were students, as when a young novice, Sister Mary Matthew, who needed to take a few grade 13 courses. So in addition to her novitiate program, she was also following three courses at St. Joe's. We now know Sister Matthew as Sister Barbara Hebert. Uh, and then Sister Joan Quinn, Vincent Martyr. Sister Joan loved the staff and students of St. Joe's and always looked forward to the yearly get together of the remaining staff members. I don't know if they still get together or not. 
After retirement from a long teaching ministry, Joan returned to Ottawa and committed herself to service on the RCIA team of the parish. She was a faithful lector and became a volunteer at now the only elementary school in the parish, St. Daniel's. Joan was the last sister who taught at St. Joe's. Her funeral in April 2015 at St. Basil's was probably the first to include liturgical dance as an expression of her joy, our joy in the resurrection and her new life in Christ. Um, and other staff members, other bazillions, several sisters who were there for a year or so and lay staff were instrumental in keeping St. Joseph's afloat. A more thorough history of the school would provide more information. So I'm talking about the, anyway. Um, what you might not know that the school closed in 75. One reason was the great, because of all the sisters who left the community, we no longer had sisters to staff the school. And also extension of full funding to Catholic high schools only started in 85. Until that time, the Ontario government provided funding up to grade 10. Sure. So grades 11, 12, and 13 had to be financed by student fees. A lot of fundraising, along with donations from the Bazillions and the sisters. Now, the sisters and priests would give part of their salary every year so that the combined amount uh, was about $60,000 each year in order to provide adequate salaries for the lay staff. When the school closed in 1975, then it became a junior high school with grades seven to 10 um, under the direction of the Ottawa Separate School Board. So the basic reason for closing the school was financial. We just couldn't keep up with the um, expenses. Um, we had sisters not living directly in the parish, but involved in the parish from 75 to 95. Um, sisters living outside appreciated coming to St. Basil's because of our excellent liturgical celebrations. We have the music, um, wonderful clergy, competent homilies, a strong sense of community, commitment to justice, and service to those on low income. That's, I think, what attracts people who aren't directly living in the parish. Um, other, you may remember that Pat Mulcahy, we refer to as the two Pats. They lived over on Ambleside and they were often involved in parish activities. And Pat Brennan, particularly, uh, for her music. Um, then with the sale of the property on Baseline Road, now Villa Marconi, some of the sisters moved to, base, to Lannister Avenue. And this happened in 1995. And so in uh, Lannister, we have Sister Eileen Collins, Sister B. Keegan, Sister Paula Lavery, Gwen Doolan, and the uh, original member was Sister Agnes Eccles. She lived for the first year, and then she was replaced by Margaret Scanlon. Um, many sisters were engaged in various parts of parish ministry. Uh, Margaret Scanlon and Barb Heber, both involved in parish council. Whoop, 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 whoop. Sorry, just go back here. Oh, you're going ahead, girl. I, I just went to something jumped here. Okay, Barb Heber. Uh, then um, many of our sisters have gotten involved in our CIA because of Education in the faith is so important to us and um, assisting the spirit in the intimate process of nurturing the candidate's relationship with Christ is important. Um, and so Margaret Scanlon, Joan Quinn, and our dear little sister Suzanne Susuma is going to be on the team this year. And liturgical ministry, according to Moore, Father Moore was greatly influenced by the monks of Salem and then liturgical renewal happened then. And so that has continued on in the community that liturgy is important to us at the center of parish and community life. So all of these sisters have been involved as lectors, as Eucharistic ministers, somehow involved in planning the liturgy. And uh, in addition to Suzanne, we also have Catherine now also helping. On the Mission and Social Justice Committee, 
Responding to the needs of the day, especially the poor, and finding just solutions has been a focus of Holy Cross and continues to inspire sisters to collaborate with others to work to create a more just society. So uh, myself and Catherine Yampa are both on the Social Justice Committee and the Catholic Women's League who continues those, um, those themes, Sister Barbara Heber and Suzanne DeSuma. Um, ministry of prayer. And since prayer and contemplation is at the heart of religious life, <laughs> Some sisters contribute to the life of the parish by praying for its needs, especially Paula Lavery. Whoop, again, it went too fast. Paula Lavery, Eileen Collins, and Gwen Doolan. An important ministry in the parish. And then other sisters living in Ottawa, we have Sister Cecile Paquette, um, who's the director of our associate program with sisters, associates, and friends of Holy Cross. Sister Cecile, uh, from her, her wheelchair, coordinates our associate program. Sister Marlene Bosch, our liturgical dancer, is to the left of Sister Cecile. And then we have two sisters in residential care, Sister Lynn Living and Jane Frances Burns. So now you know who's in Ottawa. But although the tree of Holy Cross may seem to be in its final stages, life continues in new ways. The old supporting and giving life to the new and I, to the young. I loved this tree in Pakenham a few years ago. The old tree with the, the new giving, giving life to the new. And so Holy Cross, although it may in North America seem to be dying, there is new life. In Haiti, we have um, a marvelous group of, of sisters there who are involved in education, in ministry, health care. Uh, right now, they're in a terrible state um, because we are not in the area of the earthquake, but the violence after the, even before the assassination of the president, the violence continues. There's been a lot of They'll miss the nurse who's taking care of the aunt. They're afraid to go out. In that's Agnes. She was the mistress of novices. So one, whoops, gone through. We, our sisters carry on the, their traditions. This is the sister making her final vows uh, with a dance in the square. Uh, and she's wearing her traditional dress. Uh, And here are more uh, sisters in Peru. Latin America, Peru. Up in Puno. We're in Puno and in Lima, and uh, we're concerned with the status of women and um, the needs of the, the sick and refugees, too. Our latest is in Vietnam. We have two communities in Saigon and in Buindong. And the sisters work with young people, families, um, collaborate with other congregations. And here we see them in their traditional dress as well. The novices are in the light colored dresses and the professed sisters in the Navy. And I'm going to introduce Sister Suzanne Susuma. She's going to tell you a little bit about Mali. Uh, Suzanne, is beginning her fourth year with us here in Ottawa. She, I better keep it this way. She has finished her degree at St. Paul University, a degree in theology, and now is starting a master's in education. So she's going to be well prepared when she returns to Africa to continue the mission. And this is what she is going to. Okay. Hello everyone, welcome virtually in uh, Holy Cross Mission in Mali. We are in the Diocese of Sikasso in Sikasso City. Holy Cross Mission in Mali is focused on education in different fields, which are education through faith activities, 
education through assisting to young girls in school tax and need, education through empowering women. The community of Holy Cross in Mali, in ad addition of being a community of initial formation to religious life, is involved in parish life, such as in activities of choir, CW women, accompaniment, and liturgical services. However, their main mission resides in the foyer residence for young girls and women. The mission of a foyer resident is to offer conditions for quality school education to the young and empower them for a better life in society. In the foyer, we welcome young girls and young women who are from village areas and don't have relative in the city to welcome them so that they can complete their studies as well as those who seek a safer place to stay and study. In welcoming them, the sisters assist them with library services and pedagogical help to have success in their studies. They receive other formations such as practical learning activities that empower them to be autonomous women in society. The foyer also welcome male students who want space to do group homework. Now our new perspective, discerning the reality of the region and in the whole country, a pressing need for quality school and professional education causes us to move forward in our mission. Therefore, we are looking forward to start a complete school project linked to the foyer so that we can provide all that the girls need for success in their high school education and be safe from false marriage or premature marriage consequences. The congregation bought a poverty of two hectares next to the fire for that purpose. And we are currently fencing in the land. Our second project for the future, as women, of faith and citizens, we want to support local women in their struggle for equality and responsible freedom. The congregation is in process right now to open a new mission place in Kajula City, which is another parish in the Diocese of Sikasso, where we have a project of professional sewing center for women. That project will help us actively to free a lot of women from society's prejudices, discrimination, violence, forced marriages, abuses, and poverty in their families. Next slide. <laughs> and if you move your cursor into the bottom of the screen, sister, that would help you. Yeah. That you have it now, so that there's there's the tab, bottom of the so, screen. So these two projects will sustain our desire to contribute to the quality of education in Mali, to teach universal human values for peace to the new generation, and help women restore their dignity. So I thank everyone here for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And now we will hear from uh, Sister Catherine Yampa. Um, 
Sister Catherine is beginning her third year with us. She did one year at St. Paul University in theology and now has moved to the University of Ottawa and is doing a degree in international development. Okay. Here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Catherine, and I am going to talk about our mission in Burkina Faso. So, Burkina Faso is a little country located in West Africa, and um, Holy Cross is actively present there uh, in three places: Ouagadougou, which is uh, at the center here. And we are also in Garongo and uh, Songde. Songde is um, a periphery of the capital city, Ouagadougou. So Holy Cross established its presence in, um, in Ouagadougou 2004. And there we do pastoral work, self-service, and a nutrition project for malnourished children. It's also the community of students, sisters, and the house of initial formation. A library is at the service of the young people to help them in the research. Pedagogical support is offered to help the school education. The second place is Garongo. And uh, Garongo is a little town located in the, in Tenkodogo. Tenkodogo is another diocese. And uh, the sisters is working there since uh, 2015. And they, they were invited by the diocese and uh, the administration of St. Damia High School was entrusted to them. And in 2021, this co-educational secondary school has uh, seven classes with a total of 310 students. And uh, for us, Sisters of Holy Cross, education is not only a basic right, but also liberating as Sister Jean was talking about. So the education offered to the students of Lycée Saint Damien prepares them to be the future leaders of Burkina Bay society. Education for liberation is transmitted through the learning of Christian and human values as well as well as through an openness of cultural and religious diversity and a social justice approach. Now in Sogde, Sogde is a perspective prospect for the future and it's a little village in the northern part of Ouagadougou the capital city. So face it with difficulties such as desertification, soil erosion, limited access to quality health care, especially for pregnant women and children. The elders of Sangodin turn to the Sisters of Holy Cross for help. And after discerning with the population, in response to their needs, we want to incorporate in the 50, 15, 15 hectares of property, six project. So the six projects are health center, experimental farm, primary and secondary school, formation center for women, post secondary plus technical school for professional formation and another residence for, for girls. The sisters, our congregation already has purchased the land and enclosed it with a wall 
made a topographic study, built a temporary residence for the sisters to start the mission. Now, for all of these missions, we are looking for partners to help finance the construction of a facility that will improve the quality of life of the most vulnerable. So far, we are in partnership with um, IMAS Canada. Yes, IMAS Canada. This one is um, a non-profit Christian organization and the partnership with them is most technical assistance for good quality, oops, sorry. So the collaboration with uh, IMAS Canada is right now, they are helping us for fundraising promotion. And when we finish building all of the facilities for, for the future, it will be um, assistant in medical aid and service. Yeah. And the second organization is um, EMI Canada. This one also is a non-profit Christian organization. And the partnership with them is most technical assistance for good quality and sustainable construction, using and collaborating with local resources. And uh, our last good news now is that a benefactor has pledged to match any donation for the health center in Tongue received by December 15, 2021, up to 75,000 of dollars, Canadian dollars. So if you want to be part of this project and support Holy Cross in her dreams, so you can donate and um, you can also share the information. You can also promote all of those projects and um, I have more details for that in the book. Oh, yeah, we didn't put it on. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> go on the website. Yeah. So that is all for Burkina Faso. And uh, I have to thank you for listening and for the opportunity given to talk about Holy Cross. Thank you so much. Thank you. So lot, a lot is happening in, uh, going to happen in Africa and uh, related um, countries. We are blessed with um, some, they, they did a survey, the sisters under 70, um, their pictures are here, they're 35. And we, and you know, they're from a variety of countries. The face of Holy Cross has changed for sure over the years. And uh, we are blessed this year with 22 novices, with novices in Vietnam, in Africa, in Haiti, and Peru. And for the first time in many years, we have a novice from Canada. Uh, Marie uh, Chartier is from Winnipeg, and she has joined the novitiate um, group in Peru. So um, we are blessed. And we give thanks uh, for the 60 years in St. Basil's Parish to our sisters who preceded us um, with love and gratitude for the faith-filled Brazilians and the dedicated lay staff, and particularly our present pastor. Thank you, Father, for uh, inviting us to do this. Abundant blessings to each of you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, Sister Jean. Um, what a transformation you talk about. Incredible. So um, first question is coming from Ed Lejoc. Ed, uh -huh. oh, what's your question? All right, Sister Jean, this is uh, has nothing to do with the parish. It's more about Renfrew. Um, <laughs> okay. 1958, uh, you were there. How long were how long were the, how long you personally stayed in Renfrew and how long were the sisters in Renfrew? I, because I know the convent is, was closed many years ago and it was sold. I think there's apartments in it right now. But how long were yeah. the sisters actually in Renfrew? Well, the last sister to live in Renfrew uh, was Sister Margaret Joan Picor, and she 
died, I believe, in 2017. Uh, and so we went, I can check the book. Uh, I know we celebrated uh, over 100 years in Renfrew. Um, let me see. Uh, to get it right. Oh, there, that, that, that was, thank you. <laughs> Whoever fixed my screen. Um, we were early in the uh, foundation. Yeah, we were only the second house. 18, 1887. 1887, we went to Renfrew. The very first uh, English speaking um, community was in Alexandria in 1856. And so it took three, 30 years before we got to Renfrew and then a few more years before we got to uh, Ottawa, 1929. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> well, you know that things begin with inspiration and they end with statistics question two is a, 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 in many ways a, a statistical question that I've been asked to ask you. And it's this, how many Holy Cross sisters are there in Canada today? And is it likely that the congregation will eventually disappear from Canada? Um, somebody's going to check the statistics right now for me, see how many are in Canada. Uh, you, you can check that. Um, will it disappear? Well, who knows? I think we used to think that in France, the, the community there would disappear, but so far it hasn't. And that was the foundation uh, many years ago. And so we're looking at, well, in, in English Canada, we are only um, 15, we're less than that now, but in Canada, no, Julie, in, no. All total, we are 392 sisters. There are 94 in the United States, so take those out. And then 25. It's 34 plus 14. We, we don't have it divided according to um, provinces. Um, language, 34 plus 14 is 48. Oh, I think we're about 200. 16, 17. Either 137 and 20, 150, 60, 70, 80, 90. We're about 200, about 200 in Canada. It's all of those added together. Okay. So who is going to ask the next question? Raise your hand or unmute yourself and just uh, oh, ask away. Okay, uh, Kathleen Kelly, you are you have the next question. Please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, really enjoyed that, Sister Jean. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, a long you time. Were the Jean, sister, you were, you were the Jean, one that asked the question. Yeah, Sister Jean and uh, and other sisters were my neighbors on Meadowlands uh, close by for uh, for a number of years. And uh, I, uh, my question, I have sort of two questions. One is, uh, uh, I'm an associate of the CND, so I sort of get the international expansion of communities, of international communities, such as, uh, such as Holy Cross. But uh, two questions. One is, have you, have you visited any of these countries, Jean, Haiti, Vietnam? Um, not Vietnam. I have been to Haiti. I have been to Peru and I have been blessed to go to Africa. In Africa, I was in Burkina Faso and uh, Tikiso in Mali. And uh, that is a blessing to be able to see what our sisters are doing there, the, the life they live. I, I doubt that I would be going to Vietnam, <laughs> but who knows, one never uh, erased. You know, well, erased. if I could just follow up, what were your impressions of Africa? coming from Canada? Well, I, the reason I got to, well, the sisters had been asking me to go to Africa, but I saw no way of ever getting there. But I had occasion, I received the invitation to go to Doha for an international interfaith uh, event that they were hosting in Doha. 
And that was um, an expense paid trip. And I thought, well, maybe this is the chance to go to Africa. So I was able to, to use the air miles. That's sort of a long story to say that I went from Doha, which is a very um, rich country, to the next day woke up in Wagadu. And looking out the windows of both places, I have pictures looking out of the window of the hotel in Doha and the hotel in, and the house in Wagadu. I thought, what a contrast, you know? What a contrast. How do we ever begin to bridge that, the difference? Um, you know, the, it, it um, and that image has stayed with me for a long time, right? I said, obviously you don't have an answer. Um, at Doha, their standard of living is probably is higher probably than, than here, I, I don't know. But um, it was that kind of contrast and then the hours it took to go by bus from Wagadu into Mali to Sikasso, and just wondering, are we going to get across the border? Um, life is challenging, very challenging. And, and it's been a blessing having these young sisters here and seeing what they want to do when they go back home, when they, when they see the challenges and trying to find the resources that might, they, they might be able to use when they go back home to, to help the situation of women, particularly. Um, like here in Canada, we talk about the role of women in the church and things like that. Um, in Wagadu, in, in, in Mali, they're talking about dignity of women, uh, women not being forced into marriage, um, women having a bit more freedom over their own lives. That, that's a big, big difference. So the extreme of poverty and the role of women, they, they'd be big things that I, I saw a difference. Thank you, Sister. Pat Fagan has a question. She's next. Hi, Sister. Um, Hi, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I thank you for all the work that you've done over the years, but I'd like you to ask you a favorite project of mine is multi-faith housing. Oh. How is that going since? Well, I think, I think multi-faith housing has done marvelously well. Uh, the last project was the Home for Veterans. And um, the veterans have moved in. I haven't heard anything recently about if it's full, how the residents are um, moving in, moving out, like it's supposed to be temporary kind of residence for them until they can find something more stable. But um, I think that like they've done well at the Haven. Uh, those who don't know multi-faith housing, it's a, uh, it goes by the name multi-faith our very i was a founding member our very first building was a five unit building on kent street and then we bought 10 units of a condo complex on somerset street and we've been able to maintain those as affordable housing then um we built and not built we bought an apartment building in vanier after buying it, we it, realized it needed a lot of work. We were able to get funding to make some apartments into three bedroom apartments because a lot of refugees have a lot of, lots of children. Mm -hmm. And there are rules and regulations, how many children can sleep in a bedroom, et cetera. So um, that was marvelous. Then I think the, the biggest um, project was the, the Haven out in Bar Haven. And if those who don't know anything about the Haven, just go online and you will see that it's a, a wonderfully built uh, award winning um, complex of structures and buildings and try to keep it green. And then the last project was the building for homeless veterans. I have some suggest. I have some suggestions for them for our next project. That would, but I don't know if they will go for it or not. But I've been blessed to ask. To, I've been asked to be um, a, not a sponsor, a patron. Patron. Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's what friends are for to find the right word <laughs> when you need it. Thank you. Yes. May I ask a personal question, if I may? Uh, I've been in many meetings with you, and one of the things that is a characteristic, you are unfailingly supportive. You are filled with enthusiasm. You ask the right question at the right time. Where does that come from? What sustains this approach? Because we've heard tonight decades of your doing that. What sustains you to continue in this? Oh, I don't know. Well, you don't live with me. <laughs> I'm not always like that. <laughs> you have to ask the people that I live with. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm all... <laughs> Um, I don't know, I guess, I, well, I, I would live with a supportive community. I suppose that's part of it. Uh, I hope that the, I can depend on the spirit to, to be, to be there. I try to be faithful to a time of quiet every day, just to sort of get centered in what's this all about, you know, as the, uh, the years ahead are getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> um, there are fewer ahead than our, uh, there are more behind than ahead. Um, what sustains me? I, I, I guess other people and seeing what can be accomplished when people work together and, and combine resources. And, uh, I think that's what sustained me with MHI, you know, that, uh, you see people coming together with same values and, and want to do and have some energy and that sort of, I think, encourage, encourages me too. I do get tired, you know, but anyway, <laughs> I don't know how to answer the question. <laughs> I'll, po I'll have to ponder it. Well, you certainly have answered the question <laughs> yeah, just in, in those last 30 seconds. Um, uh, who is going to be our uh, next question? We're winding this down. We've got a couple more questions and then we have another thing to add uh, at the end. So who is uh, who has the next question? I can't see a hand waving. Does anyone have a story to tell? From Canada, we do talk. Oh, the number of sisters in Canada, we're 245. Somebody asked that question. Thank Number you. And I, and I did see Sister Denise de Roche wave her hand. So she's up next. Okay. She's our animator for English Canada, English Ontario. It's not a question, Jean, but it's my admiration I want to express tonight. And the question from Kevin, he really, really put the right words on your personality, on your way to be with people. And uh, thank you for these good news about Ottawa, about the new way we began to uh, educate. And it was a good idea to, to invite Suzanne and and Catherine, because the mission in Holy Cross continued differently. Um, in 1847, Father Moreau sent just a little groups, you know, sisters, brothers, and fathers, okay, go to Canada. And we went, we, we arrived here. And now we are called to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to consider not just hear us. Don't, don't be afraid you will um, miss us. I think we will continue with the associates with the new form of consecration and we will continue elsewhere too, in Africa, in Vietnam, in Haiti. I have the the privilege and the grace to teach on Zoom to the novices last year and this year. But I'm so, um, I'm so happy to be able to be with them two hours or four hours a week. You know, we are, 
very close and Holy Cross and Father Morrow's uh, intuition continue differently. It's not our property. It's the grace and the charism of Father Morrow and it will continue the time God would like to see us on this planet. I have a, a lot of hope with you, Jean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Denise. That was absolutely lovely. I now invite my colleague Margot Latimer. She's on uh, the liturgy, um, liturgy Committee here uh, at St. Basil's and a longtime parish member. Uh, so, Margot. Great. Thank you. Sister Jean, what a delightful presentation with you and Sister Suzanne and Sister Catherine. That's an extra bonus for us as well. Like Ed Loziak, I was privileged to be taught by the Holy Cross Sisters as well from the time I was nine years old. Um, I was a student at St. Basil School in 1959 when my, my, father, my father was in the military. So when we were posted here, I went to St. Basil's and then um, went on to St. Joseph's High School for the five years of, of high school. Um, I have to tell you that the education we had uh, was really superior and to this day, uh, there's an amazing connection between ourselves and the other students that went to St. Basil School and St. Joseph's High School. Um, there's a word that we can't even, even describe the feeling that we have, the connection that we have. Um, we were definitely um, taught in a very faith-filled environment uh, with true respect and caring for others. Um, but it was almost magical. I know that sounds really strange, but, and I really put full credit back to the education from the Holy Cross Sisters and the Brazilian Fathers. Um, at our high school, we had boys in one wing and girls in the other. And uh, it wasn't until grade 13 that we, uh, we crossed uh, where we had uh, the boys in our class in grade 13. Um, a little secret here, from the time I was in kindergarten up, I thought I was going to be a nun. And Sister Mary Vincent, who I just adored, uh, Sister Joan Quinn that we all know at St. Basil's, brought me to your convent on Baseline and uh, gave me a tour with a few other girls. And I got to meet some of the novices and some of the postulants. Um, but then as uh, high school progressed, <laughs> in the latter part of grade nine, I actually met my long-term boyfriend, who is now my husband, Pat. So our principal, Father Sheehan, was quite, uh, quite upset that I was dating uh, at that point. But uh, I have seen him through the years and have lined up our four children when we went to communion to him to show him it was okay. It was all right that this, ha <laughs> this happened. But again... Um, with our education itself, it was quite interesting. When you look back, even at our grade 13 class, uh, we, we were taught so well that going on to university was a very easy transition. Um, the leadership skills we gained as well uh, was second to none. Uh, in my own particular grade 13 class, um, we ended up with seven doctors uh, five lawyers. Uh, I went into nursing science at Ottawa U along with three others. Uh, very successful business people and public servants. So it was quite um, interesting to see. And that's a real tribute to the Holy Cross sisters. And the example they showed us of um, working as a team with the Bazillion fathers and the lay staff was really um, quite incredible. So I think the, really what happened is the Holy Cross Sisters, as you can see from Sister Jean's presentation today, um, were multitaskers. And I think you coined that, that, that term. Um, and when I hear what, um, you know, what other areas of the city and the world that you're continuing on, there is so much hope for the Holy Cross Sisters as, as you progress on. So we have really truly been privileged to have you in our midst. So thank you, Sister Jean and Sister Catherine and Sister Suzanne for, for today's presentation. Um, and so you're all personally shining examples of us of Christian, Christian faith in action. Thank you to the Holy Cross sisters who preceded you. And thank you all um, to um, those who are with you now. The world and St. Basil's Parish has certainly benefited from you. 
And today's um, presentation was a real trip down memory lane and it's certainly very appreciated. I had my Kleenex nearby <laughs> and I know some of my classmates are online as well and others that can't be here are going to look at it um, as well. So thank you very much. It was very well done. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank and you. now I'm gonna pass it back to Father Daryl to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Margot. Uh, thanks, everyone tonight. Thanks, the sisters. I am um, <clears throat> very excited to show you the plaque which um, the bishop uh, here, if our Archbishop of Ottawa Cornwall, was able to bless last night at Mass on, on Saturday evening. And then uh, this morning, the parish, uh, as we gathered this morning, the whole parish blessed this plaque. I want to show it to you now if I can get my cat off of it. He's, he thinks he's taking a nap on it. but if, So this is the plaque. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to read what it says. It's the same dimension as the plaque that we have in the church already, uh, remembering and honoring the work of the Bazillion Fathers. So it's the same dimensions. And it says, this plaque uh, commemorates the years of faithful ministry, past, present, and future, because they're still here with us. The Bazillions left in 92. The, the sisters are still here. And we see a future still. The question was, is there a future? We're counting on it. We're counting on it. Um, uh, the past, present, and future of the Sisters of Holy Cross in the Archdiocese of Ottawa. I was supposed to be Archdiocese of Ottawa Cornwall. It was a mistake. But I think we still get the point here. And then the motto, Ave Crux Spes Unica, which is really a Latin of... Uh, sorry, is the motto of the whole Holy Cross family, uh, means uh, hail Holy Cross, you are uh, our only hope, something like that. That's the idea. And it's from the parishioners of St. Basil's Parish today, September the 12th, 2021. I, I think you can see it there. It looks like it's backwards. I don't know. Okay. So that's the first thing. Then um, my niece, I, I wish my niece would... Um, unmute her face she's on tonight but i don't know if we can see her or not um Hi. is she there there they are that's my sister and my niece my niece uh has been very busy this week uh making gifts for the sisters of holy cross Please. and this is the so they she made uh these four medallions there's four of them. It's for the sisters living in Ottawa. Sister Gwen, Sister Jean, Sister Suzanne, and Sister Catherine. They're beaded uh, in the style of Ojibwe uh, beaders here in um, here in Ottawa. It's oh, hand beaded. And you can see it's the beautiful image. of it's, There's the dagger, here the sword, and then the CSC. And then in the background are little Ojibwe flowers. Oh, they're Ojibwe. beautiful. It's stunning. It's, it's st I can't believe how beautiful they are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to my niece, Jessie. She thank also you, made. Thank you uh, very much. Pardon me? Thank you very much. Yes, they're gorgeous. I'll, I'll deliver them to you on Wednesday. Okay. Uh, also, uh, my niece made the medallion, a nice big medallion for Mary Jo Letty um, way back last year when Mary Jo Letty presented. And um, Mary Jo Letty was over the moon with it when she received it. She hasn't cast our check yet, but she's wearing the medallion. So um, <laughs> we're waiting for her to cash the check. So I just want to thank my niece for her uh, talent that she's sharing with the parish and offering it to the various people speakers in our uh, webinar series and um, I, I don't know what more I can say except that um, I feel that we've corrected the mistakes that have taken place over these years sister this is what this is about it's correcting this uh, lack of acknowledging your ministry the, your community's ministry in the church because women are often um, left out you know, there we don't acknowledge. We acknowledge all the priests and all the bishops and all that, and we often don't acknowledge all the work of the uh, women in the church. And that's one thing I wanted to make sure we do to make that correction. And uh, so uh, that's part of the thing. And um, anyways, 
I'm not sure what further more to say, except uh, um, uh, this has been a great evening, you know, and uh, I want to thank everyone who has participated. We had as many as 40 people tonight, mm -hmm. more than that, because um, some screens were shared. So um, that's what we have. And I'm not sure who's going to close now. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Well, the only way to close is to wish everybody um, an end of summer experience. We're in that first week of the next thing. Um, and what we've heard tonight, what we've been encouraged to listen to and encouraged to consider tonight is this un unflinching optimism and unflinching commitment to the next thing. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Sister Jean. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you for your questions and comments. And it's almost 8.30. It's 8.31. It's time to say goodnight. <laughs>